Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, we are very happy to have this meeting today. So I will be short in my presentation as uh, our guest today will have to leave 15 minutes uh, earlier and you will understand why in a few, in few minutes. So a few words to say that French President Emmanuel Macron uh, was re-elected on Sunday, April 24, despite the second lowest turnout in more than 50 years in France. The far right represented by Marine Le Pen broke the threshold of 40%, more than 40%, by the way, of the vote for the first time in the history. Uh, Emmanuel Macron's victory ensured that France will remain part of the West and NATO for the foreseeable future, which is very important for us, for sure. Yet the strong showing by Marine Le Pen's far right nationalist party is deeply troubling. Uh, and we could add, and we should add, that also the, the move of the extreme left with Jean-Luc Mélenchon, but uh, I think uh, our guest today will speak about that, is very tr troubling too. It's a very special situation that we are facing now in France. To help understand the stakes of the French election, we are happy to welcome a, a, a very good friend of us, of Internet, Benjamin Haddad, who is the senior director of the European Center at the Atlantic Council. He is an expert in European politics and transatlantic relations. Before moving to the Atlantic Council, he was a fellow at Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C., and was always a good friend of Elnet. And I should add that since Thursday, Thursday evening, he is now running also for the election in the French Parliament to be member of the National Assembly, and it's very, very happy to have, uh, to have him with us today. Uh, Benjamin, I prepared for you five questions, and then we will have time to move to our audience. And I'm sure that we'll have they will have tens of questions to ask you. You will do our your best to answer as many questions as possible. The first question is: uh, could, could you share with us in few words uh, your analysis of Emmanuel Macron's victory? Yeah. Uh, first, look, uh, I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, with all of you. It's uh, a crazy few days for me as I'm uh, starting my first run for office and the, the parliamentary election will be in, uh, in mid-June. But it was really important for me still to uh, have this conversation with, with Pelnet um, because a, as you said, uh, Arie, I've been a, a long-standing friend and supporter of uh, the incredible work that you guys are doing uh, all across Europe to promote better understanding dialogue uh, between uh, European democracies and Israel. Um, and I think you've been very successful at it. And I think we've seen the changes uh, when it comes to support for Israel after the wave of uh, terror attacks, uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, question of the Iranian nuclear uh, program. Um, uh, and we'll talk about other issues, but I think uh, the evolution that we've seen in the last few years is, is largely due to the terrific work that, uh, that you're doing. And so uh, uh, it's, it's always a great pleasure uh, to be with you, Arie, to see you, Larry, and, and, and everyone, uh, and to have this, uh, this conversation. Um, let me say a, a quick word on uh, Emmanuel Macron's re-election, um, just to give some historical context to show how uh, historic, actually, this re-election is. Uh, Emmanuel Macron is the first French president to be re-elected in 15 years. He is actually the first French president in 50 years to be re-elected when holding a parliamentary uh, majority. Um, and he won with 59% of the vote uh, against Marine Le Pen, uh, overperforming uh, polls before uh, um, the election. So this is, I, this is a very strong showing. Some people, a lot of people voted for him uh, out of support for his uh, platform. Uh, some people also voted for him, and I think that's a warning to him, that's a warning to our majority uh, to uh, um, bar Marine Le Pen from being elected president, and that's something that we'll have to, uh, to hear. He still needs to get a parliamentary majority in the upcoming uh, legislative elections in mid-June. But Arie, you said it, and I think it's very important, um, the fact that uh, the extreme left of Jean-Luc Mélenchon and the extreme right of Marine Le Pen showed such a strong showing in the first round. And Marine Le Pen had a historic uh, uh, vote uh, support uh, with 50, 40%, 41% of the vote in the second round is a warning. It is a democratic warning for, uh, for France. The next five years will be tough. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of uh, tension uh, in the country. We have seen this with the different crisis that France has come through in the last few years especially the Yellow Jackets crisis. So 
Um, I think he he will need to answer. I think the the strong demand you have uh, on economic issues, on social issues, on environmental issues, also coming from the left, that's going to be a big uh, priority uh, for him. All the while uh, developing his European agenda, that has been really core to his political message, identity, and uh, platform ever since he became not even president but a candidate at a time of uh, war striking the European continent back. Um, and he was today giving a, a speech on his vision of, of the European Union. Maybe we'll say a bit uh, a bit more about this. But I'll 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 stick I'll, I'll stay here there and uh, I'll hear back to you for the second question. Yeah, yes. The second question uh, will be the, the continuation of what you said because, as you said, it's the first time in the history of the Fifth Republic that a president is re-elected. It means that nobody knows what is to be re-elected in France. So. How do you, what do you feel about what will be uh, the priorities of Emmanuel Macron in the coming months? And we know that when you are on, on the, uh, in a position for five years, it's very fast. So you have to act very quickly. So how do you see the priorities of, uh, of Emmanuel Macron this time? Yeah, so look, I think one big priority of Emmanuel Macron ever since he became uh, president in 2017 has been reforming the French economy, has been making sure that we stay uh, competitive, that we... Uh, have a uh, labor market that's actually open to all. That was the first thing he did in 2017, is reforming the famously rigid French labor market. We've seen unemployment drop dramatically in the last five years, despite COVID, despite all the crises that we've been through. We have the lowest unemployment numbers since uh, 15 years, to the point that it hasn't even been an issue in the campaign when it was the preeminent issue of French politics for uh, 30 years. He's always put growth and innovation at the core of his message. So I think we'll, we'll continue to see this uh, momentum for reform. You know, one big item is uh, reforming the pension system in France uh, and, and, and making sure that it stays sustainable in the, in the long run. We have one incredible uh, uh, chance in France is that we have very high uh, life expectancy, uh, but it also means that we have to reform our pension system so that everyone can still benefit from uh, full pension. So that's, I think, gonna be a, 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 big, a big priority. A second big priority will be uh, the environmental uh, transition. Uh, he said that his prime minister, he will appoint his new government next week. We'll have a new prime minister. He said his prime minister will have the environment as a top uh, priority. So I think we'll see this very high on the agenda. Uh, and then the third one, and maybe I should have started with this, but I said that earlier, is going still to, going to be Europe. Um, he you know, has, I think, a strong European record. We had the COVID recovery package that was... A historic uh, 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 step forward in uh, creating more integration uh, at the uh, European level with Angela Merkel last year. But I think as we see Russian aggression on Ukraine, um, we really need to step up our defense efforts, both individual member states, but at the European level, step up our effort in terms of energy independence. Actually, France is in a very good position on this. France depends on uh, Russia much less than other European partners. Uh, it's much more energy independent, largely thanks to uh, nuclear energy. So it's been, France has been pushing in the last few months for more sanctions, uh, uh, embargo on oil. And I think down the road we'll go, we'll get to at some point an embargo on, on gas, but we need everyone on board on this. Obviously Germany's more dependent on Russian gas than we are. We, I think, get 18% of our gas from Russia. Germany is more like 55%. So we need to push on uh, uh, diversity from suppliers. We need to push uh, on renewables. And I would say also at the European level on uh, investing in nuclear uh, energy. So I think that at the European level is going to be a huge uh, priority. And then, uh, you know, how do we make sure that we uh, secure our, uh, our neighborhood? You have uh, the European relationship with Ukraine, but you also have Georgia, Moldova, the Western Balkans. So how can we get Europeans to act and think like a power. I think that's, you know, if, if you were to ask me what would be Emmanuel Macron's legacy in one sentence, I think that would be really at the top of it. Thank you, I mean, uh, My third question is, uh, uh, what do French politics portend for the future of France, Europe, and the, for sure, relation with Israel is so, which is so important uh, uh, for us. Uh, and I will add, uh, how do, you, th uh, how do you, th you think it will uh, connect with the Abraham Accord also? That's a great question. Um, first, I think we've seen actually a blossoming of the relationship between France and Israel 
over the last few years. Um, and largely due to the fact that, you know, the relationship between France and Europe, by the way, in Israel, is not mostly about uh, geopolitical issues. It's about trade. It's about innovation, tech, the environment. You know, I always say that anecdotally, something that's very interesting is the first two French ministers of Macron in 2017 who visited Israel were the economics minister and the minister for digital issues. And that says something about how Israel is viewed right now as a hub for innovation, as a startup nation in, uh, in Europe, as a model for a lot of uh, how Europe also should, uh, should act on this. I think that's been really a key factor and we're gonna continue to see, I think, a strong deepening of, of the relationship when it comes to that. Another aspect is of course that France, as you all know, has been struck by uh, Islamist terrorism in the last years. Uh, we had a, a major wave in 2014, 2015, but we've also had a lot of uh, traumatic terror attacks in the last few years, like Samuel Paty, uh, the history professor who was uh, beheaded by a, a jihadi uh, terrorist. Um, that was a, a huge trauma for the French population. So I think there's a sense of bonding between uh, France and Israel over these issues. I think that is really key, in addition to, of course, a lot of uh, exchanges and partnerships on uh, intelligence, for example. Another aspect is Iran um, and uh, President Macron. I actually interviewed him for the Atlantic Council last year and asked him about JCPOA and Iran. Uh, France supports the idea of a new agreement on nuclear issues with, uh, with Iran. France was against the U.S. withdrawal from the JCPOA. But I think France has also held a pretty tough position within Europe, within the E3, on these issues. And... Uh, when I asked President Macron last year about this, he said, you know, a new agreement ideally should also include ballistic missiles. We should also have a serious conversation about the sunset clause. We should also address Iranian malign influence in the region and support for terror groups uh, like Hezbollah and, uh, and others. Uh, and we should also make sure that we consult with allies and uh, on the agreement, he had mentioned two allies, Israel and, and Saudi Arabia on, uh, on this. I think these are really some of the core pillars. Then you ask about the Abraham Accords, and I really think that that can be a big priority for the, for the next few years. I'll be honest, I think that uh, France, uh, I, Europe actually, the European Union has been late in understanding the tectonic shift that the Abraham Accords represented. Uh, maybe because it came from Trump, maybe because it didn't follow the plan that Europeans had fought through in, uh, in the region. Uh, but I think now a few years in the making, we see that this wasn't just a piece of paper or a political ploy, that there's something much deeper uh, at stake between uh, especially the UAE and others uh, supported in Israel. Um, and, and that there's, I think, momentum to be built, especially I would say on the non-political issues, uh, economic relations, trade tech. I was in Dubai in November uh, and visited the Bosch Khalifa Tower in the elevator, everyone spoke Hebrew around me. I mean, in terms of tourism, I think you had 200,000 Israeli tourists in, uh, in, in the UAE in 2020. I mean, this is absolutely historic. And this is where the EU can play really an interesting role. I mean, if you think about, for example, getting some form of trade agreement between uh, the European Union and the countries of the Abraham Accord, if you can think about what it means in terms of investment for uh, the environment, investment in in tech, I think this is really where France could be a leader in the next few years. I think France and Macron can probably have a, a, a more agile, a more creative and innovative way of, of thinking about uh, the region in, in Europe and be a, be a driver. Other countries in Central Europe, you know, I think, I, I think have been very uh, um, uh, at the forefront of this. You know, when I go to the Czech Republic, for example, they're very enthusiastic about the Abraham Accord. So, I really think that could be a great opportunity for uh, uh, President Macron in Israel in the next five years. Um, we will go back a little bit about what's going on in, uh, in, in uh, East Europe. And uh, my, my next question is, how is Europe changing as a result of the uh, war, uh, Russia's war in, in, in Ukraine? I don't know if you have uh, the opportunity to listen to the speech of uh, the President Macron for the European Day, because today is the European Day in, in Europe. It's uh, 9 of May. It's also the day of celebration of uh, Vladimir Putin for the 
the victory in the in the Second World War. But how, how do you see this? What is your assessment about uh, the changing in Europe? Yeah, look, I think this is this is a historical moment for Europe, uh, and war is back on the European continent, and I think we have to draw uh, the consequences from it. Uh, the first thing we've seen, really, in the the, the couple days that followed uh, the war was a lot of European countries deciding to rearm. It's going to be a slow generational movement, but you see Germany announcing a 100 billion euro investment in one year uh, to uh, update its military equipment, going back to uh, more than 2% of uh, defense spending. I mean, remember the debates we had with Trump at the time over this, and now that we have European countries moving. Poland announcing that it's moving to 3%. Finland and Sweden announcing that they want to join NATO. So in the way we think about military issues, it's a, it's a tectonic shift uh, in, in Europe. And I think it's an opportunity to build up also more European coordination and cooperation. Sorry to get a little technical on this, but if you add the defense budgets of all 27 members of the European Union, we are the second military spender in the world after the United States. Does that really translate in operational capabilities, in presence on the ground? Of course not, because you have so many redundancies, so many problems of coordination that uh, you, know, you have duplications on a lot of equipment. So I think that's a big challenge at the EU level is to make sure that we can also not only increase our defense budget, but do it together so we have more uh, uh, capacity to act. And then we need to uh, you know, think like a power. We need to understand that uh, we are in a world where you have countries like Russia, like China, that think in terms of power politics, that use uh, energy uh, relations, not as normal trade where you trade a, uh, a utility, but as, a, as leverage, as a tool of power and influence over our democracies. So it's completely updating our, our software. And I think that's something that he really wants to push with his agenda of European sovereignty. Let's think like a power. Um, I think that's that's really core to his to his message on the European Union. Um, so, uh, but I know that it's a subject that you you know very well. What would be the uh, the implication of this situation between Russia and 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 Ukraine for Israel and the region? How do you see the, the move in the, on the strategic arena according to that? Yeah. Well, so first, something I forgot that I think is really important. Of course, Emmanuel Macron also supports sanctions on Russia and more sanctions. He supports weapons delivery to Ukraine. That was actually a big deal during the election. I think that played a role in the campaign. Uh, both Marine Le Pen and Jean-Luc Mélenchon on the far left were seen as pro-Russian, uh, were against sanctions, against uh, weapons delivery. They sort of adapted their tune as we went, because the French population is largely supportive of uh, supporting Ukraine. Um, but I think that that, that was a, a key dividing aspect in this campaign. And I think Macron, uh, you know, has been very supportive of, uh, of, of Ukrainian sovereignty. Um, what does this mean for, um, for Israel? Look, um, I think uh, Israel is in, a, is in a difficult position on this, right? Because Russia is present in Syria. I think Israel has been able uh, to uh, both at the same time be a very strong ally to the United States, but at the same time manage to have sort of a constructive, de-conflicting relationship with, with Russia on its, uh, on its border. We've seen Naftali Bennett, I think that was very positive, try to play a mediating role between Ukraine and Russia at the beginning of this conflict. Uh, he visited Zelensky and, uh, and Putin, uh, tried to... Um, convey messages. And I think all these diplomatic channels are, are very important. Macron is trying to do the same. Right now, Russia is closed to diplomacy. Uh, I think there's no seriousness on, on Moscow's side uh, to uh, have a serious diplomatic conversation. Uh, we've seen Zelensky, on the contrary, say, you know, for example, that he's flexible on U Ukraine's NATO application uh, if he were to get security guarantees from Western countries. Uh, we've seen him even say that he's ready to give more autonomy, more decentralization to Donbass. Right now, Russia is not open to this, but I do think Israel could continue to try to play a official or unofficial role as a back channel with other countries like, uh, like France, but also Turkey. Um, the only way we can achieve this, though, is by continuing to support Ukraine. The only way that at some point 
Russia realizes that there's no other option than either stop its aggression or even go to some form of ceasefire and diplomatic process is because it feels stuck on the, on the ground. And so it's because we've given Ukrainians the means to defend themselves. And so this is why I think continuing sanctioning and continuing weapons delivery is, uh, is really important. One last thing I would add on European rearmament, uh, I, I really think this is uh, positive for Israel. I think that, you know, seeing Europeans take security matters seriously, uh, think in terms of threat, in terms of risk, uh, will, I think, automatically mean that you'll see a, uh, a, a stronger relationship with, with Israel as well. Um, because, you know, for a long time, the European Union was built on this idea of uh, overcoming, transcending relations of power, replacing them with law, economics, diplomacy. I've written a lot about this. And on the one hand, the European Union is, one, I think, one of the most successful political projects in history. We've managed to replace war on the European continent with this kind of, of technical cooperation. But it, sometimes it's also poorly prepared Europeans in understanding the rest of the world, that the rest of the world, unfortunately, still works in terms of military relationships, in terms of conflict, in terms of power politics. And so seeing war back on the European continent, I think, awakens Europeans also to um, how other countries like Israel have been dealing and facing with a hostile environment. And so my, my guess is that we'll see a, a, a stronger form of intellectual convergence also uh, between Jerusalem and, and European countries, if that makes sense. Thank you very much. So. Uh